10. The Doctrine of Ransom The key doctrines of Scripture are strongly offensive to humanistic man. Such things as God's sovereignty, predestination, grace and much more ring ominously in rebellious ears of an offence against man's claim to autonomy. The term ransom is one of these offensive notes of Scripture. Ransom, in Hebrew kofer, comes from a word meaning to wipe off or to expiate. It is reference to a redemption fee paid to rescue a man from the law or from his captor. The Greek word is litron. Our Lord says plainly in Mark chapter 10 verse 45, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. Man the sinner is in captivity to sin. Romans chapter 6 verse 17, 23, chapter 7 verse 14. The sinner is a slave, doomed to die. Jesus Christ affects the ransom of his people by the payment of a price, his life for the life of his people. Paul speaks of the redeemed as, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath sent forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Romans chapter 3 verses 24 to 26. We are told, first of all, that our justification, our legal acquittal and release, is an act of grace by Jesus Christ. It is not our work, but his. Second, he is the ransom or the redemption God has set forth, literally, the deliverance affected by the payment of a ransom. As Hodge observed, Christ is presented as a redeemer, not in the character of a teacher or witness, but of a priest, a sacrifice, a propitiation. Third, God set forth Jesus Christ as a propitiatory sacrifice for sin to satisfy the requirements of God's justice. Our redemption, then, is not our work, nor due to any change in us, but it is the work of Christ, our new Adam, who then begets us into the new creation in his own likeness as a new humanity. Fourth, this sacrifice declares God's righteousness. It sets forth the nature and demand of God's law, so that we see in Christ's atonement not only the greatness of God's grace and mercy, but also the unswerving and eternal validity of his law. Fifth, the remission of sins is affected, their forgiveness, because Jesus Christ renders satisfaction. All men in Christ stand only in his righteousness. Hodge commented, a plan of salvation which strips every man of merit and places all sinners on the same level before God of course cuts off all assumption of superiority of one class over another. Paul means to say that the result of the gospel plan of salvation is to prevent all self-approbation, self-gratulation and exaltation on the part of the sinner. He is presented as despoiled of all merit and as deserving the displeasure of God. He can attribute in no degree his deliverance from this displeasure to himself, and he cannot exalt himself, either in the presence of God or in comparison with his fellow sinners. As sin is odious in the sight of God, it is essential, in any scheme of mercy, that the sinner should be made to feel this, and that nothing done by him or for him should in any measure diminish his sense of personal ill desert on account of his transgressions. This result obviously could not follow from any plan of justification that placed the ground of the sinner's acceptance in himself or his peculiar advantages of birth or ecclesiastical connection. But it is effectually secured by that plan of justification which not only places the ground of his acceptance entirely out of himself, but which also requires, as the very condition of that acceptance, an act involving a penitent acknowledgement of personal ill-desert 
an exclusive dependence on the merit of another. In our time, the word ransom has come to have a lawless meaning. It is often used by terrorists who seek to exact a tribute from others which they believe is due to their cause. The original meaning of ransom has to do with law, not lawlessness. In Scripture, it has reference to the price paid for a forfeited life or for delivery from capital punishment, as in Exodus chapter 21, verse 30. It is the price paid for pardon of sins and for the redemption of the sinner from death. Job chapter 33, verse 24. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. Only certain offences were subject to ransom. In the usage of the term by our Lord, it means redemption from the bondage of sin and from the penalties of sin to which sinners are subject by God's law. This redemption is accomplished by Christ as our federal head and Adam and our substitute. The emphasis which this doctrine makes is on the immutability of God's law. The antinomian misinterprets Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am come not to destroy, but to fulfill. If fulfill means to end or to put away, the sentence becomes an absurdity. Then our Lord is saying that he has not come to destroy, but really to destroy, abolish, or to make unnecessary. This is an absurdity. Rather, he is emphatic that he has come to put the law into force. Matthew chapter 5, verses 18 to 20. Paul, in Romans chapter 3, verses 24 to 26, is also emphatic that Christ's atonement sets forth this same fact of God's righteousness and justice. The propitiation is required by God's justice, and God is just. The law is not cancelled or made void by the atonement, nor by faith. It is upheld. Romans chapter 3, verse 31. The necessity for the atonement is a vindication of the abiding force of the law. Thus, first, instead of being undermined, the validity of the law is very strongly set forth by the atonement. Man's revolt against God's law is so serious a fact that only the work of God the Son can undo it. Man, apart from Christ, is a doomed creature. Second, grace thus does not cancel nor make void the law. Romans chapter 3 verse 31. Grace witnesses to the necessary and valid claims of the law and provides the ransom price, the only begotten Son of God, our substitute. Third, that ransom price is the blood of Jesus Christ, in whom we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. It is the great and unchanging seriousness of God's law that makes clear the greatness of his grace and mercy. Our deliverance or redemption is more than a mere rescue. It is a ransom, the payment of the due price, the death penalty for sin. This price Jesus Christ paid in his atoning death. Fourth, because we have been redeemed at so great a cost, we must therefore face all our todays and tomorrows in a spirit of faith, obedience and gratitude. For the Christian to sin now is to despise God's law and grace alike. Therefore, Paul urges, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, 
which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. For ye are brought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 10 and 11, and verses 18 to 20. Fifth, to be ransomed means to be freed. We are freed, not from the law as the righteousness or justice of God, but from the death penalty of the law, from sin and death into righteousness and life. The, quote, handwriting of ordinances that was against us, that is, the indictment of death, was taken away and nailed to the cross by Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. Our freedom now is not from the law, but in grace, whereby we stand before God as legally righteous or justified. Romans chapter 3, verse 24. And now a commission to put God's law into force. Romans chapter 8, verse 4. As the means of establishing God's kingdom and dominion. Antinomianism has received a very great impetus in the past two centuries through the influence of Romanticism. Romanticism sought to free man from an opposed order and to freedom to create his own order. Man had, as his first goal, the creation of his quote, authentic self, end quote, and then the full and free expression of that self. This meant freedom from any order or pattern imposed by God and man. The artist was seen as the pioneer in and the prophet of this true liberation. As Talman noted, The human miracle of genius was absolved from all moral and other obligations, since the genius was a force of nature which bloweth where it listeth. This meant that both the slavery of man to sin in the fall and man's ransom and freedom in grace and law in Christ were anathema to the Romantics. The Marquis de Sade was merely more emphatic than others in believing that man's freedom is from Christ and in sin. Camus observed, Romanticism, Lucifer-like in its rebellion, is really only useful for adventures of the imagination. Like Sad, Romanticism is separated from earlier forms of rebellion by its preference for evil and the individual. By putting emphasis on its powers of defiance and refusal, rebellion, at this stage, forgets its positive content. Since God claims all that is good in man, it is necessary to deride what is good and choose what is evil. Hatred of death and of injustice will lead, therefore, if not to the exercise, at least to the vindication of evil and murder. For such a faith, the idea of ransom becomes the epitome of repression and offence. Man then seeks release not to God, but from God, into autonomy. The doctrine of ransom thus recalls us to the fact that God's law governs all things and is essential to man's life and being. Instead of a freedom in sin, there is slavery. For whosoever committeth sin is the servant or slave of sin. John chapter 8 verse 34 The ransomed man is the free man because his relationship to the law is changed from seeing it as a repressive force to finding it basic to life. To be ransomed by the new Adam, Jesus Christ, means to be taken from death to life and from grief to hope and joy. As the scope of the ransom increases and unfolds, it means that, at the same time, the power of the ransomed and their joy will become all the more notable and the impact of the new life will be felt in every area of life and thought. Isaiah tells us, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing, or in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. 
in the habitation of dragons, where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. And the highway shall be there, and the way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs of everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Isaiah chapter 35, verses 5 to 10. The atonement of Jesus Christ undoes the work and reign of the fall, so that the legal restoration of man, which is accompanied by his regeneration and moral restoration, has as its conclusion the restoration of creation. The doctrine of ransom, thus, is closely connected with restoration, 